Chapter 16, Conquering the Continent, 1854-1890. So we're going back a little bit in time here, going back to really before this class starts, going back into the, the first half of American history, just to kind of get caught up with what's happening with the westward expansion movement. So the westward expansion movement goes across both classes. So we're, we're going to catch up with it here, but but really this is kind of an anomaly, this chapter. The, the rest of the of the chapters in the in the book and in, in this class will be about the industrial revolution and moving to the modern world. So we chapter 15, we put a rest to the Civil War reconstruction, and we're somewhat putting a rest to westward expansion here and moving on, we're going in a different direction. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh there was a feeling after this war, the Civil War, it was a new beginning, a fresh start. And many white men in the South that had been dispossessed by the war lost everything. You have African Americans trying to find their place in an oppressive in South and an unwelcoming North. <clears throat> you have Native Americans clinging desperately to the hope uh, that they would that the tide would turn for them. Uh, so this idea after the war, you turn back to what's called manifest destiny, uh, the, uh, sim symbolized by this famous painting called America's Progress, uh, painted by John Bass in 1872. <clears throat> And this, so the idea of manifest destiny is that God had chosen the white Christian people as the ones to spread across the land, to make it their own, to, to, to turn it into a Christian society organized by white supremacy. Non-whites would be converted and fit in the best they could, but of course with, with no real opportunity to advance, okay? If you look at this image, and it's not the best uh, image, it's a little bit blurry, you can't see all of it, but essentially you, you have this angel, and, and this is this is Columbia, the, the symbol of America, the female version of Uncle Sam, let's say, and she is floating across, she's moving east to west. If you look behind her, it's been enlightened. You can see this, it, it's bright there, and, and over here, you, you, you can't see it real good in this in this. Uh, image but this is a this is a a river with ships and trade and commerce and factory this is progress okay this this is the this is the future you've got you've got railroads and covered wagons and the pony express and stage coaches you've got miners you've got farmers settlers this is the future all all these people are moving west following uh the uh, the angel the the uh the angel, this is the uh, angel to the West, um, moving to the West. Uh, who's running from her? Well, you look down here, it's, it's, the, it's the buffalo, it's the Native Americans. They're running from here. It's not light here. It hasn't been enlightened yet. <clears throat> so the idea of manifest destiny is pushing out the old and bringing in the new. So the old is the Native Americans, their ways, their customs, their cultures, uh, their, their uh, culture of hunting the buffalo. Uh, their, you know, simple ways uh, is replaced by progress and uh, industrialization and capitalism. So this is the go-to image you see at the bottom there. It's, in, it's titled Manifest Destiny. Okay, so you're moving across the West. The war's over. You you don't have that, that doesn't take up your time and your thoughts anymore. I mean, going on going on for a long time. It's built up for a long time, and you have this long war. But now it's over, so you move west. But in the East by this time, mid-1800s, 1860, 70, the Native Americans in the East had, had been subdued. They, they weren't really around anymore. They had been removed. They'd been pushed out, uh, trail of tears. They were, they were forced out, but most died from disease. But they hadn't, they hadn't gone to the West yet. The, the white Europeans, the, the, the American settlers at this point, hadn't gone to the West yet in, in force because they... They had a they had this war that had been going on for a long time, or at least the build up to it. So they knew moving west that these natives uh, would have to be subdued or removed. So, you know, they have a dilemma. What do we do with these people, with these natives in the west? Uh, so, you know, this is a this is this this is the big question, and this is of course in modern uh, time, modern history we look at this as Perhaps a shameful moment. It's 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 uh, 
it's been uh, presented as a heroic moment, the Western movement and these awesome great people, settlers, and, and with, without question they were, but, but was it done in a, in a, in a uh, friendly way, in a benevolent way? You, know, you, you, have a, you have a constitution that says everyone's equal, but then you go across and you, and you subdue the land and subdue the people. Is that, is that another paradox, another anomaly, okay? <clears throat> And and we'll we'll also see in this chapter how the land changes so very quickly. Uh, Native Americans worshipped the land; uh, they lived within it. They would never think of tearing it apart. They treaded lightly on it. They it, it was sacred to them. The buffalo was sacred to them. And even though they hunted and killed them for meat and and tools and furs and blankets, <clears throat> it was still a huge part of their life. And they and they. Uh, prayed over the buffalo and thanked it for its sacrifice. They they didn't hunt for a hundred of them to sell a hundred skins. They just hunted for what they needed. Take what you need, leave the rest. The Europeans were different. They came and cleared forests right away for tobacco plantations. Tore down, uh, tore it down for land to plant and and changed the way it looked very quickly. The land hadn't hadn't changed in centuries and just a matter of of a couple of decades, it was it was changed by the Europeans. They were different types of people. Europeans brought the plow in to break up the earth. They put barbed wire around parcels of land and had this thing called private property. Natives had no idea what that meant. the The earth was for everybody. Uh, but the uh, so you have this you have these people with two different points of view. Strip mining came in where they tore up mountaintops and destroyed the beauty of the land for for what some gold dust out of, out of the mountain mountains that the natives couldn't understand this this idea. So the so the American government is thinking how do we bring these people under control and make it easier for us to to go across the land and make it ours. So going back to the buffalo, this was a sacred part of the natives lives they would hunt the buffalo and like i said they they would you know hunt for one or two not a hundred like the europeans might do because you you can you can you can eat one and sell 99 and, and sell skins and sell you know oil and and uh meat and you know it, it's it's always a way to make money where the native americans were just it was it was subsistence okay uh so the the American government knew that the that the buffalo was sacred to their life and that their whole lives depended on the buffalo. So they had a great idea. We've got all these veterans from this war, sharpshooters. So let's bring them into the plains and have them kill all the buffalo. Just indiscriminately kill them. And, and you don't have to hunt them because they're everywhere. There's there's um, hundreds of thousands, if not if not millions. Uh, the buffalo was everywhere before the Europeans came. And, but they sent, you know, dozens of hunters into the plains, all different areas, and just said, just kill them all one by one. Boom, 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 down the line. Drop them where they stand and leave them. Don't worry about them. Just let them ride. Uh, of course, the, the Native Americans are appalled by this. Who would do this, this beautiful animal that, that gives us our life? You know, who could be so cruel? How, how could they be so, uh, you know, horrific about about uh, these animals? Uh, and, you know, why would they do that? Well, I mean, it's to take away not only their food source, but their sacred way of life. So the Native Americans, uh, as the Western westward movement began, were shaken at the atrocities of the white man. This is a poem that, that kind of. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed a, a slide here. So this is a this is a pretty uh, sobering image here. That is a pile of buffalo skulls um, of the sharpshooters that went out and killed all the buffalo. So this is just one pile in, in probably hundreds around the plains. But to give you an idea, one group of men that were sent to take out the buffalo killed that many. Those are all just skulls. Okay, so. You can see how the idea of exterminating them worked pretty well, and and they almost did. The buffalo was uh, in very small numbers. They still are compared to what they used to be, but they've come back a little. But for for many years, it was thought that the, that the buffalo would become extinct because they were they were all you know genocide. They were all killed. Okay, okay. Uh, this is the poem um, that 
kind of says it all here. Um, there was a time when the land was sacred and the ancient ones were as one with it. A time when only the children of the great spirit were here to light their fires in these places with no boundaries. When the forests were as thick as the fur of a winter bear. <clears throat> when a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo. When the deserts were in bloom and the streams pure as freshly fallen snow. In that time when there were only simple ways, I saw with my heart the conflicts to come, and whether it was to be for good or bad, what was certain was there that there would be change. Let's just kind of take a closer look at this. There was a time, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a time when the land was sacred and the ancient ones were as one with it. This is before the white man came. It was just natives, indigenous people here. A time when only the children of the great spirit were here to light their fires in these places with no boundaries, no private property, no barbed wire. All the, the land was for everybody. When the forests were as thick as the fur of a winter bear, not chopped down to, to build a settlement or to plant. When a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo before the sharpshooters came in and killed them all. When the deserts were in bloom and the streams pure as freshly fallen snow, until the uh, until the Europeans built dams and and uh, overfished the the streams and lakes because again the Europeans don't want to catch fish for dinner they want to catch 500 fish to sell them okay again the, the natives caught what they needed to eat so they the uh, the, the fish were gone and um, because of the dams many fish died because they didn't have their the habitat that they were used to. Uh, so everything changed, okay? The, the the land changed. Everything about the Native Americans' lives changed because of these people that came, okay? Another interesting painting of that of this era is the, called The Coming of the White Man. So this is, of course, you see these natives on the shore cowering with fear from this from this approaching ship. You, hear, you see here on the horizon, the ship out here, that, that presumably is symbolically anyway Columbus. Okay, Columbus is the first one to come and he starts the wave that, that never ends, that, that, that marks the day one of the, of the end of the Native American lifestyle. Um, okay, so, so wait a minute. So what happened to the benevolent Christians ordained by God? Okay, God said that you're my favorite people. And I give you the, the right to go across the land and make it your own. Would God approve of, of slaughtering innocent animals? Okay, so another paradox. So, so understand that the history of Native Americans in the lands of the United States is vital and needs to be known and understood to fully grasp the history of the United States. So again, social history, we, we give them a voice. Native Americans haven't had much of a voice in the American history story for, for most of our history until the last couple decades. So they were, they were part of the story too. What's their story? Um, okay, their story is, like I said, an important part. So at the end of the war, uh, the end of the war allowed people to revisit this westward expansion, like I said earlier. And you have the uh, the transcontinental railroad. So this is not an actual railroad that went from the Atlantic to, to the Pacific. It starts in Omaha, Nebraska, and goes into Sacramento, uh, which which ultimately went to San Francisco. The reason why there's no no uh, railroad here is they were already there was already rail railroads here that, that ended here. So the transcontinental railroad connected to an existing system, but it did give access from from uh, Sea to Shining Sea from East Coast to West Coast. So this is completed 1869, begun during the Civil War. This is a huge uh, advancement, but understand what it does. It brings more people. It now is easier to, to come to the West. You don't have to spend months in a covered wagon. You can simply spend days on a train. And now, now you've got uh, rails everywhere. You've got telegraph lines and all these all these uh, items that the natives had never seen before. And, and this is the coming of the white man. They, they, they're tearing apart our sacred land and they're, and they're changing it for the, for the negative, okay? Uh, so an interesting idea about the Transcontinental Railroad. So going back to the idea of the obsession with Asian goods we talked about uh, earlier uh, in the, in the uh, uh, 
the uh, talk about trade. And um, so the idea that this transcontinental railroad finally finished what Christopher Columbus started. So what does that mean? When Christopher Columbus went out into the world to, to find a faster way to Asia to get Asian goods, Chinese goods. Well, the Transcontinental Railroad kind of finished that job. They finally found a fast way to do it. Now you can get Asian goods from, from uh, across the Pacific by ship to San Francisco by rail to New York. And there you go. Okay. Um, let me see. Here am I. So what, what, what was it like for these people that were indigenous uh, in the Southwest as well? The federal courts promoted economic development at the expense of racial justice. So this is the Southwest, not the Southeast, not the, not the South. This is the Southwest. This is where California is at. Uh, we talked about the Mexican-American War briefly, and it's this manufactured war. And uh, what happened to the people that that um, had been living there for for all their lives, perhaps generations? Uh, these Mexican people were forced off their former lands. We don't want you to be part of this country. The discrimination of Mexicans who found themselves now living in land considered to be the United States before the war it was Mexico. Now it's the United States. Forced off their off their lands, justified in the name of economic gain. Get them off the land and farm that land, get, get more crops, make more money. This left thousands of Hispanic Mexican peoples homeless. Uh, and, and they come, and they, and they come with different industries. Mining became a huge industry, and, and the Native Americans had no, no idea what, what, it, what are you people doing tearing apart all the mountains and, and leveling mountaintops and you know, to, to bring this coal out and then this silver and, and, and this gold and all these things. Um, you know, this was a this was a, a, a different kind of uh, idea that they it, it was uh, it was new to them. But, you know, a miner is an iconic image of, of the American West. We we uh, we see this as very American, uh, the the independent miner. We also see cattle drives as very American, the, the Cowboys in the old west. So, so what is a what is a cattle drive? You know, when you when you get that railroad to come in, now you're going to drive your cattle from Texas up to up to Omaha, wherever the wherever the railroad might be at. Now you can ship your cattle alive by rail car to Chicago, where the where the slaughtering uh, houses were. Instead of slaughtering the 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 cattle in Texas and shipping the beef where it goes bad. Now you can do that. And later with refrigerated cars, they lasted even longer. So this is progress for the European people. How do you get people to come to these new lands? The Homestead Act. You give away uh, 160 acres of land for free. You give it away. Uh, all you got to do is come there, claim it, and stay there for five years and improve it, and it will be your land. So this created a stampede of people, free land. And people came by the droves and populated the, the plains, and the natives were pushed out and in just a matter of a couple decades. Uh, of course, during the Homestead Act, the lands were shown as empty and nobody there, although there were thousands of people already living there. So it's kind of like Columbus all over again, right? Um, discovering something that, that people were, were living in. But what's the environmental impact of all these people coming uh, to take over this, these these 160 acre plots, um, you know, it doesn't turn out so good. There's not enough water, and all the water that's, that's there is used, so the land goes into disrepair. So this beautiful plains that have been been serene for centuries turns like this in in just a matter of a few decades. Uh, and it was determined that 160 acres was too much land to maintain without water. But the settlers were defiant. This is part of the American character that, that, that grows. We'll talk more about in this westward movement, this defiant kind of arrogant uh, American that, you know, damn the torpedoes, get out of my way. I can do anything. OK. And their point of view was not to think about the environmental impact, but be, be bold. We want to get the land subdued and the, and the wild nature out of it. Well, you know, subduing Mother Nature is not that easy. It's not. It's not just simply making a rash statement. Okay. Uh, 
So the destruction of the land, overplowed land, this, this created an avenue for weeds and, ins and destructive ins insects, also erosion, and the land in a very short time became uh, much different than what it had used to be. It, it, been, it, it, it was destroyed very quickly. Uh, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce tribe, um, he, he, they're they're watching this. They can't stop it. You know, they, they're all they're all dying from disease, and they they can't mount a defense. But they're watching these people come and trample over their sacred lands. And uh, Chief jo Joseph says, you know, Americans were not settling an empty West. They were unsettling it by taking it from the native peoples who already lived there. Okay, so this is the this is the true story of the of westward expansion. It's not it's not the romantic heroic uh, you know uh, way that we've always heard it. Now, not to suggest it's not a little bit that it, it is that, but not entirely. There, there's a whole side of, of this story that people don't haven't been taught and people don't want to learn. So that's what we're doing here. We're 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 learning the thorny side of of the westward expansion also. Okay, let's do supplemental lecture number two right here. So we've done one of these. Um, you kind of got your feet wet with that. You know what's going on. You know where to go to find instruction about these modules week one. Scroll down to assignment instructions. Read the written instructions. Watch the uh, video tutorial about what a supplemental lecture is. Don't forget they are reviews, not research projects. Okay. Clash of Two Cultures is the name of our number two lecture here. So let's look at our outline, introduction, and what that what the introduction is is tell me about the English point of view about natives. Uh, number two and three would be the main points. And uh, number two is Max Weber. It's pronounced Weber, not Weber. And he talks about what he what he coined as the Puritan or Protestant work ethic. Number three, what's the results of that? You, you, the, the result is two very different cultures that could not compromise or integrate. So the two cultures I'm talking about are Native Americans and American settlers, indigenous, uh, uh, indigenous peoples, Native peoples, and American settlers. And then finally, of course, the relevance. So again, you want to give me an intro, you talk about the main points in detail, and state the relevance. Word for word is fine. If you want me to see it in bold print, that's fine too. What is the relevance of this lecture? It's a little bit longer than usual. The Europeans felt the Native Americans were not ambitious because they were not taking advantage of opportunities. They felt that they were lazy. This was against their work ethic that started with the Protestant work ethic that is permeated into everyday American society from the Puritan days and their fear of predestination and not being a member of God's elect. So it's a religious background that, that kind of develops into a fear and an obsession that creates this Protestant work ethic. That's what this what this uh, what this lecture is about. Okay. <clears throat> okay, there's your outline. Let's start. So so uh, so we've talked about Native Americans and you know a little bit in the early times. This is the story. The westward expansion is the story of their final demise as a free people and a player of consequence in American history. So, so what happens between these two people, Europeans and natives? It's a clash of two very different cultures, and it seemed impossible for the two to come together and compromise due to their vast differences. They just they just were so different that they couldn't come to a compromise. Uh, it, it it turned out, um, and we'll and we'll learn about this later. The the French uh, actually integrated better with the Indians than the English. They they didn't they didn't uh, see them as inferiors quite like the English did. The English saw them as as very inferior. Um, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened if the French had won the French and Indian War in the 1760s and how if the English had been expelled from the continent, what would it be like here today if the French had won? That would be interesting. So the English despised the, despised the Native Americans from the very, very beginning. Um, in fact, the first occurrence of biological warfare in American history took place during the French and Indian War when the English offered Native Americans a gift of blankets. And of course, they're they're surprised and distrustful. You know why? Why would you do that? You hate us. Why are you giving us blankets? 
but they say, well, we're, we're you know, it's it's a peace offering. We're trying to be nice. Well, it turns out the blankets have been infected with smallpox, and when the natives used them, many of them got smallpox and died. So biological war for the first instance. Two very different people with very different wants came into conflict with each other. So when you think of the Great Plains, word association, what comes to mind? This comes to mind, you know, or I should say image association. You know, you know, a a flat, dry area, um, not desert, but but dry, not not a, you know a, a, a wet environment, but 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 the buffalo is part of it. A beautiful blue sky, white cloud. This this is kind of the the you know uh, romantic image of what the Great Plains look like. Okay. Uh, and this is what it looked like for centuries. And the natives uh, hunted the buffalo on it. And like I said, when they killed one, they would use every part of that buffalo, the meat for food, the bones for tools, the, the organs for oil, the, the skins for, for blankets and, and teepees and the horns for scrapers and weapons. And then they would bless the, the animal for its sacrifice but when they left it, it was mostly just a skeleton. It wasn't they, they used all of it, and they would, like I said, not not hundreds, just one. But after the Europeans came and killed them all and pushed the natives out, the Great Plains changed very, very quickly. If you've ever flown across the United States in an airplane and looked down crossing the Great Plains, it doesn't look like this so much. It looks like this because that's what it looks like now. The Europeans come in and claim little you know parcels of land for their own farms and and this is where they and this is how they live so i'm not criticizing this necessarily i'm just just trying to point out how the land changed from these two different points of these two different cultures and their points of view you can't argue about the great plains the great plains feeds the world the, the, the great plains you know has an incredible agricultural output each year and part of a you know, part of the economy of, of the United States, but that's not my point. I, I mean, I that's it, it, that's true, but the point I'm trying to make is how the land changed dramatically and quickly when the Europeans came. Okay, um, uh, so initially the Great Plains had been set aside for the Indians. That's if you go back to Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears, pushing them, forcing them out, they were told to go there, cross the Mississippi and stay over there and leave us alone. But the opportunities in the West proved to be too much for the American government to stay away from. And they broke their promise again and came and started to push them back even further. There, there was an idea to assimilate them by Americanizing them. Uh, page 525 of your book, Reformers called for new policies that would destroy Native people's traditional life ways. So what does that mean? To take away your culture, take away your language, your religion, destroy your life ways, and turn you into a European or an American, civilize them, or as one reformer put it, kill the Indian and save the man. Don't kill the person, but take whatever part of the Indian out of him and convert him into a European. So you have you have short hair, you have European clothes, and you have a farm. And that's what we do. If you if you can do that, we will integrate you into our culture. Go ahead. That's extremely ethnocentric, right? This is, you know, one one culture is we're, we're better than you are, you should be like us. Okay. So you have this problem as this westward expansion happens. What these, these two cultures come together. One culture is laid back, let the world come to them, and they would, would respond to it. You know, getting ahead and gaining riches was not in their vocabulary. They didn't understand that. Uh, but the Europeans came for opportunity and wealth and, and excitement and gain and prosperity. And, and that was going to happen by, by um, you know, massive projects, whether it's plantations or planting or mining or whatever it might be, uh, uh, timber, you know, lumber, whatever it might be there, but they're destroying the land to, to, to gain wealth. Okay. Uh, so it, it's um, most, most of the, um, most Americans that came West had come from the Eastern United States. Uh, many were from the Northeast. So there, even though this is 1800s, there was still a very strong Puritan work ethic that had developed there. The Puritans, although they were, weren't much of an influence in the 
hundreds. They were a huge influence in the 1600s and the early late 1500s, and and they they were one of the original colonies, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and they were known as being very harsh and very strict, God fearing, fire and brimstone, male dominated, very very harsh and strict people. Uh, but they but they left a legacy that that continues on all these years later, 300 years into the in, into even the present. Okay, this principle is known as the Puritan work ethic or the Protestant work ethic. Uh, and that is what became the measure of a, of a Puritan man was his, was his work ethic, okay? So according to the sociologist Max Weber, it's not Weber, it's Weber. Now, now understand, and this is where people go astray with if they write about this, if it's a choice. Um, I, I'm not suggesting to you that Max Weber was a Puritan and and dis and develop the Puritan work ethic. That's not at all what this is. Max Weber is 200 years later, looking back on history and and making an argument about who the Puritans were. And and he he's he his argument is that their work ethic has permeated into everyday American society. It's part of our culture, part of our identity that we still have. And then I'll make a point about what that has to do with the clash of these two cultures. Okay. Okay, so in his book, The Protestant Work Ethic, so Protestant or Puritan, it's interchangeable, same thing, okay? The Protestant Work Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism, uh, Weber explains how the Puritans lived, and, and the Puritans believed that God had a plan for all people, and that a certain group of them called the elect were predestined to reside in heaven after their life was completed. So, you know, again, in a classroom, 40 people, if I'm God and, and you're my people that I've that I've created uh, out of 40, 20 of you will come with me and reside in heaven with me. 20 of you won't. But unfortunately, nobody knew whether they were a member of the elect or not. God didn't say you. Yes, you know, he just said some of you. OK. So the Puritans became obsessed with this. A, a, a person could only speculate as to their destiny. Uh, what if I'm not one of the elect? So it was believed that by Puritans, <clears throat> excuse me, if if people began if if people began to believe uh, that if you pursued a virtuous life that included hard work, honesty, frugality. Asceticism. Asceticism is, asceticism is the avoidance of indulgence. All these, you know, uh, all these ideas, these kind of humble ideas, that would increase the, the chances of being included as one of as one of God's chosen people. If I live a virtuous life and do so my whole life and work hard and push, push hard, hard work. I must be one of the elect. Uh, you know, I'm not lazy. I'm I'm, I'm working hard. So. So this this idea began, according to Web to Weber, I almost said it myself. Myself Weber, the doctrine of predestination. So predestination is this idea that God's predetermined who's going to heaven and who's not. The doctrine of predestination was the dogmatic background of the Puritan morality in the sense of methodically rationalized ethical conduct. So working hard and being successful in business. And working 18 hours a day became a popular vehicle to gain the favor of God. And the Puritans believed back in the 15 and 1600s. Now understand that we're going back in time here. People believed that living like that would increase one's chances of joining God's elect. But but also it gave the impression to one's community that these that that you had to be predestined based on the way that you were living and that you would be saved by God. Okay, uh, so this ideal became important, and hard work became a definitive of the Puritan community and became ingrained in the people. The principle became a standard of Puritan life in the 1500s and 1600s, not the 1800s. We're going back in time and talking about the Puritans and how this how this ideology of working hard began. And then I'm going to make a point about it, okay? Uh, this became a standard of Puritan life, and it, it was used as an example to encourage others to work hard in their lives as a method to please God. 
So what happened is as the Puritans started to diminish in power, their work ethic didn't. And this value permeated into everyday American life. Hard work with tenacity became part of the American character, especially in the westward movement. Uh, so the result is Weber, Weber's, there I go again, Weber's idea of the Protestant work ethic. And, and this became embedded in people of all stations. You didn't have to be a Puritan. You didn't have to be religious. If you're an American, we are somewhat driven harder than most people. And Weber is arguing that it started with the Puritans and that that's where it came from. And it's it's even though they're they're gone as an influence, the Puritan or Protestant work ethics is still here. And we still have this today it permeates into everyday American life. So this this helps explain why Americans were driven so hard to gain and excel. It was ingrained in their culture for a couple hundred years. So what does this have to do with our two cultures, that, that the clash of cultures, the, the indigenous and, and the American settler? When these two cultures came together, the white people saw the Indians as lazy because they and uncommitted to growth and progress. Why aren't you tearing down that forest to build a, a city? Why aren't you leveling that mountain to get gold? Why aren't you planting fields? Why aren't you you know, tearing down things in, for, for progress? They just didn't see it that way. You know, the, the Americans were motivated by profit in making money. And in their minds, this was accomplished by working hard to please God, even though the, the westward settlers perhaps weren't thinking that way. But it was ingrained in, the, in their in their uh, in their being as an American, because it's very American to be like that. Where did it start? The Puritans. OK. OK. Uh, so to, to end the lecture, the, the relevance, excuse me, of the lecture. One more time, it's in your outline. The Europeans felt the Native Americans were not ambitious because they were not taking advantage of opportunities. They felt they were lazy. This was against their work ethic that started with the Protestant work ethic that is permeating the everyday American society from the Puritan days and their fear of predestination and not being a member of God's elect. So again, follow the outline. If it's in the outline, you should write about it. So again, tell me about Max Weber. Many times people write about the Puritan work ethic, but they don't mention Max Weber. It's it's his argument, so he deserves the credit. Make sure you, that you tell me about that, okay? Okay, uh, let's move on here. Um, so we're still talking about the westward expansion. 1868, the Sioux were finally defeated, and they are given a, uh, a reservation. And that green you see there is their reservation. And the fact is, as bad as it was for them, they, they were pretty happy about this piece of land because it was where their sacred lands were. It had been their hunting ground for years. So, OK, you you win, Americans. Leave us alone. Don't come on our, our reservation. We'll take care of ourselves. Uh, we're defeated and that's fine. But we're OK. We're happy here. OK. Uh, but then uh, white men crossed into the land secretly because they weren't supposed to be on there. Uh, looking for gold, and they discovered gold. Of course, what happens when you discover gold? People go crazy, especially in those days. Uh, so President Grant, Ulysses Grant, finds out about this. Now, he had just negotiated the treaty, I mean, or he was part of it. He had just given this land to the natives, and they were they were okay with it. And, okay, we'll stay out of your way. It's, you get everything else. We'll take it. And, and now, now there's gold there. Grant wants that gold, and you know, a, a government needs funds to to run a country. So gold strikes are one way to get it. So let's get that gold. But we just gave this land to the native to the Sioux. So how do we get it back? So Grant tries to negotiate with them to to buy the land back, and they're saying buy it back for for money. What we don't want your money. What what do we do with money? We just want to live our way of life. We don't understand money and bills and coins. We don't get that. So what do we what do we have to do with your money? Where do we go? We got all this money with nowhere to go. So no, we we're, you you made an agreement. We're happy here. Leave us alone. So so Grant gets a little angry about this, and um, he uh, he sends in a man named George Custer. So you've probably heard of Custer before, George Armstrong Custer, uh, famous. Uh, 
red, for, for his red hair, a Civil War hero, and of course famous for his, his last stand where, where he is killed. And that's where I'm heading here. So, so Grant sent Custer in to the reservation to determine if there was gold there. And, and he comes back and says, yes, there was. But the Sioux ref refused to sell the land. Uh, and, but of course, they know if the word gets out, there's going to be you know, droves of people coming here, typically white men that are going to, it's going to be a gold rush. So what are we going to do? So Grant doesn't quite know how to, uh, you know, what to do next. Uh, the Sioux aren't going to sell, but he wants that gold. So I don't know. I don't know if it's true or not. It's rumor, perhaps. But somehow, some way, somebody uh, let the word out, and the and the white uh, miners came, and they came on and trampled the plant, the uh, not the plantation, the reservation. And suddenly, after the the Sioux thought they that they they lost, but they came out okay. Now they're losing it again. So they get they get very very angry and and they look around and here's these miners tearing up the mountains looking for gold destroying the land taking the sacredness out of the land okay uh, the the chief of of the uh, Sioux was Sitting Bull and he's very angry and he decides we're going to go and sit this out you know we're not going to give up our land but we can't stay here because the white men are are running it ragged so we got to go. So let's get all the chiefs together and go out to the Little Bighorn, which is a river, and we'll wait it out there. And the truth is they had many thousands of men, many, many more men than Custer thought. Uh, when Grant saw uh, Sidney Bull do that, he sent Custer in to quell what he assumed was going to be a rebellion. The truth is Sidney Bull wasn't going to wasn't going to have a rebellion he was just sick and tired of the broken promises and went to went to wait it out to see what what was going to happen but grant was worried so so custer goes in there with a thousand men thinking that that's more than enough to to suppress this native uh what they thought was an uprising but it turned out that sitting bull had seven thousand men and you have this battle you know this is called custer's last stand or the battle of little bighorn uh, what's significant about this is every troop in in uh, uh, Custer's command was killed, including Custer himself, 36 years old. And it became a rallying cry. Okay, and America's history uh, has held this up as an atrocity against Custer. I mean, the 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 people were were broken promises. It wasn't it wasn't an atrocity against Custer. Uh, they just couldn't under, couldn't figure out what these people were doing. Custer came out to them. They saw it as a threat, and they and they had a battle, and they were outmanned. But this is held up as as you know a, a huge uh, moment, a sacred moment in American history, much like the the uh, remember the Alamo and and things like that. So so Custer's last stand, you know, gave the Americans a justification for conquering the Indians. Because now it's been proved that they've been proved to be the savages that the government thought they were all along. So that's not the way you hear that story usually. You know, you it's it's not told that way. Custer's a hero, and he's he's uh, you know outman, and he fights the, to the bitter end, just like Davy Crockett at the Alamo. That a, a, another kind of myth and legend in American history that I won't go into here. But um, so the truth hurts. The the truth undoes the legend. The the, the truth takes away the the uh, patrioticness of Custer. And I, I'm not blaming Custer. He was just doing what he was told. But but the truth is that the Native Americans did not instigate this. The the, the government did by allowing miners to go on to the reservation that they had just given to the to the Sioux by treaty. Okay. This is a huge victory for the natives, but it will prove to be the last one. And from this point on, the Sioux were hunted relentlessly by the American people for killing Custer. The Nez Perce, you know, were finally finally surrendered. And one by one, they surrender. And for the most part, the Native Americans had been conquered and subdued. So you know, again, most people do not know that it was provoked by a gold rush of white people uh, who should not have been on that land in the first place. Uh, 
So, you know, again, many Americans, especially white Americans, see Custer as a hero and are sympathetic to him and his men that in their minds were massacred by the Indians. So not, not entirely, okay? Um, okay, so that's the that's the last victory, but but it's not over yet, but it's it's about to be. So there was a dance called the Ghost Dance. And this was a, a sacred dance that the that the natives did. And and what the ghost dance was designed to do was to push the whites back to the east where they came from, and even better, across the big ocean to back where they originally came from. Get get them out of here, uh, get our lives back. Okay, uh, to return to the old ways, uh, but but it, it was not meant to be. You know, their time as a free people was over in a land that coveted freedom. Another paradox. Okay, so the ghost dance was an innocent thing. It wasn't a war dance, but whites feared the dance. They they thought it they, they thought it would provoke violence or war. Okay, so so at a place called Wounded Knee, South Dakota. Uh, Wounded Knee is it was at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, still a relevant reservation today. Uh, and this would prove to be the last hurrah of the Native Americans. So what happened was the, the Lakota people there, uh, there wasn't many of them left. It was mostly older men, women, and children. Um, they start doing the ghost dance. Now there's there's American troops there that are kind of monitoring them and so there's there's a contingent of american military there they're watching these people do this ghost dance and and they're fearful they think they're, they're going to attack us so before they attack us let's attack them so the army attacks these unarmed lakota people mostly older men women and children and massacred them for no apparent reason they didn't have any weapons they they weren't threatening anybody they weren't, uh, you know, doing anything that that was going to hurt anybody. They were just doing a dance, but they were all massacred because these troops were worried about what this ghost dance actually meant. Uh, this is from your book, a quote from your book. The deaths at Wounded Knee stand as a final indictment of decades of relentless U.S. expansion, white ignorance and greed, chaotic and conflicting policies and bloody mistakes. That would not be the way that you would be uh, that I was taught that when I was young, sixties and seventies. Uh, that would not be the way that that was that was uh, uh, reported. Okay, it, it wouldn't be about white ignorance and greed. You wouldn't hear things like that. But we're but we're we're rethinking this now. We're looking back and let's be let's be truthful here. And, and it, it was greed and and selfishness and uh, lots of broken promises and treaties that 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 ended this. So the deaths that wounded knee, that is the final nail in the coffin and the Native Americans are officially subdued uh, in the West and manifest destiny has worked and the entire country is, is now the same, the size that it is now, okay? So 1893, the, the uh, historian named Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, he was a prominent historian at that time, and he proclaimed that now that this is over, the American frontier was closed. It's the end of the American frontier because there's no further land to conquer. Uh, and the westward expansion was complete, and it had accomplished much. The ideals of manifest destiny had been realized. Uh, as the still young country had expanded across the entire continent of the Pacific coast, he also points out the American character that I mentioned earlier, and he, and he points out the American character had changed in the process. They became a people on the move, seemingly able to face any obstacles in their path. Uh, you know, after previously being a landlocked society on the eastern coast, pinned in by the Appalachian Mountains going way back before the revolution, the people that came west were different, or they became different. The people that stayed stayed the same. Uh, so, according to Turner, the westward expansion created a different type of people with different values than their eastern brethren. And even today, a person that grew up in the, on the east coast is different from the person that grew up in the west. Uh, 
why why were they different? It was it was the challenge of the constantly moving frontier across a vast piece of land. Uh, the, the the frontier is, is the is the kind of no man's land between the native people and the American settlers, and that of course would be constantly moving west as the Americans gain ground. Uh, so according to Turner, this resulted in the creation of a, of a new American image and character, which was different from their European roots, where of course the Europeans came from, as well as their own people in the Eastern United States. And this character took on, uh, became mythic almost immediately. And you start this pushing of Western heroes, pulp fiction, cheap dime novels, of, of people reading about the Wild West and all these all these romantic and adventurous stories. So the conquest of the frontier in the West took on a meaning all its own, propelling these American pioneers to the heights of popularity worldwide. Considered ho heroic and their exploits captivated the country as well, and talking about the East Coast, as well as capturing the imaginations of people in Europe. Everybody wanted to read about the Wild West. The truth is that the, the story needed no embellishment. The, the, the true story is exciting enough, but yet that's what happened. As the stories of the West became tall tales and exaggerated beyond their reality. According to the historian Roger A. Hall, the drama of the frontier as it was presented to Eastern audiences in the late 19th century was certainly fictional. Even when it sprang from actual events, it'd be embellished, exaggerated. It both perpetuated myths and provided realistic images. Uh, so this 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 somewhat uh, new business began, and that that's pushing the the wild west. Uh, everybody wanted to have a piece of it. If you're in the east or in Europe, you wanted to to read about the wild Indians and the gunfighters and the sheriffs and the shootouts and while, while that did happen on occasion, it's a very, very small uh, minority of, of, of the West's true histories about that, but that's what only that's all that we hear about. Okay. The conquering of the West was immediately exaggerated and, and turned into myth. Larger than life characters, like I said, gunslingers, sheriffs, fighting savages, and always winning, okay? The true story is much less romantic, perhaps not so inspiring. Uh, but all the exaggerations and, uh, and embellishments about the savage Indian gunfighters, tall tales, like I said, a very small part of the real story, but yet off it runs. And, and we still have it. We're, we're, we're still fascinated with the West. Hollywood still churns out Western movies of, of the great white heroes taming the Wild West. OK. Uh, and tales of, of captivity were, were hugely popular. You know, white women being kidnapped away from their families and taken to live with native peoples. Uh, and this happened. Um, but they were usually one-sided. And, you know, the, the atrocities committed were always the natives against the whites. But the truth is... Uh, Atrocities were committed by both sides, but you don't hear about the it the other way. You only hear about the natives doing it, okay? Uh, atrocities were committed by people of European descent upon Native Americans many, many times. So over time, these stories become exaggerated. It helped create the myth that Native Americans were barbaric savages and you know could never be civilized. There's that word again. They never be never they can never be part of our society so we should get rid of them not integrate them uh even two american frontier legends okay Dan, uh, daniel boone was called the indian killer and here you see him about to scalp a, a native person uh davy crockett the indian fighter okay again uh, mythical heroic you know fighting these barbaric people that were in their way of their destiny. And the truth is they lived there. You're the ones that came, okay? Uh, <clears throat> according to the historian uh, Bert Fireman, the West was not won by guns, it was won by shovels and sweat. So there you go, that's the truth right there. Yes, there were shootouts. Yes, there were, there were uh, Indian attacks. And, and yes, there were, there were sheriffs that were heroic, but but a very small part. The truth is the, the, the story about the West was, was the work of a tenacious people 
uh, and this is where that American character developed. They're the ones that tamed the West. But the true story is not as exciting as the exaggeration. Stuart L. Uh, Udell is an historian, spent a lifetime studying heroic figures of the West, people like Wyatt Earp, Billy the Kid, Jesse James, and, and others. And he concluded that he was unable to find a single thing any of these killers did to advance the cause of civilization. Yet several hundred books have been written that have made these men icons for millions of Americans. A very small percentage of the stories about these men, but they take up 99% of the copy. You know, there's there's endless books and movies and, and films done about these people, not not about the real people. Okay, so it's 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 been it's been greatly exaggerated. Uh, a man named Buffalo Bill Cody saw saw a opportunity here. Now, Buffalo, why they call him Buffalo Bill Cody? He had been in the Civil War, was a sharpshooter. He was one of the sharpshooters that came to the plains and killed the buffalo indiscriminately to get rid of them. So they called him Buffalo Bill. This is where the Buffalo Bills NFL team get their name. He has a brilliant idea. If if the if the East Coast and Europe want to want want the West, let's take let's take it to them. And he starts what's called the Wild West Show. And this is a huge show. Um, this is like a like a, a a carnival and a rodeo and a and a you know jamboree all mixed into one. And people would come, thousands of people would come in this huge arena and and watch reenactments of these battles and these shootouts and and these native attacks and and with with always the great white man coming to the rescue and, and saving the damsel in distress. Uh, Cody even went so far as to hire uh, actual Indians that 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 were part of the fight. So so now people came because wow, there's a real live Indian. So now if you're living in New York City or there's you know there wasn't anything like that going on, there was no Native Americans running around in the late 1800s. Now you can go to the Wild West show and see a real one, a Native American that fought against the American settlers. In fact, Cody hired Sitting Bull himself. That's that's Buffalo Bill with Sitting Bull. <clears throat> so, you know, of course, this is, um, uh, you know, this is embarrassing, isn't it? For Sitting Bull, uh, you know, you, you, is this what you've stooped to, the former proud chief and now you're now you're being hired to play yourself and defeated in front of crowds you know he he said you know what it's better than sitting around this damn reservation that i, I don't have any attachment to so i'm going to do that so he did that so people came from miles away to see the real live sitting bull in person the man that defeated custer <clears throat> okay so this is a this, this is what happens the <clears throat> the the Wild West, the, the, the Western story has been exaggerated greatly, hugely to the point where it's nearly out of control and it, it seems like there's no stopping it. We're we're trying to temper it as historians today and and bring it out of the uh, out of the lofty heights it's it's risen to, but it's difficult because people don't want to let go of it. Okay. Okay, let's do another supplemental lecture here. So Understand how these work. They're they're random. They don't they don't come in any kind of order. They don't come one per chapter. They don't come one per week. They they come random. There might be two chapters go by. And there won't be one, and then there'll be two and one. There might be two back to back. So you never really know when these are coming. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the name of this lecture is called How the West Was Won. Okay. So let's look at our outline. So we we know what's going on here by now. Introductions number one, I'll always give you the introduction. How the West was won was actually a Hollywood movie, and I'll talk about that. <clears throat> and then we'll we'll relate uh you know manifest destiny into this a little bit. So we've talked about that a little bit already, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more. Um Turner, Frederick Jackson Turner, we'll bring him back into it again. We'll talk about his his idea of the frontier line, the end of the frontier, and the new American character. <clears throat> Number three is the rugged individualist, and we'll talk about the exaggerations of these people. The Wild West show, we've already talked about pulp books, and the uh, famous actor that probably most of you don't, don't know, but John Wayne of the of the second half of the, um, well, I guess from the 1930s and the 1970s was the go-to 
Western hero actor that that somewhat symbolized this new American character. Get out of my way. I, I can I can fix anything and do anything. Nobody can stop me. Relevance. Uh, the truth of the Western expansion era is like much of recorded American history. And these people's lives and experiences get lost in legend and the real history is obscured. <laughs> Today, a typical American is still not ready to let go of the myths of their Western history and embrace the realities of the American story. Okay. Okay, so let's start here. So I got this title from a movie that was filmed in 1963, and this was a hugely epic film that every major star of that time was in. Everybody wanted to be in this film. And for, for me personally, where, where I, I, I grew up in the city where MGM was, okay? Uh, and across the, on the other side of town was the David L. Selznick Studios where Gone with the Wind was filmed. So I, I, I mean, Hollywood and that whole thing, I've, I've been, you know, um, uh, been around all my life and, so, and I remember I was I was seven years old in, in 1963 but I remember then being in town and having all these Indians and, and cowboys and you know all these extras walking around town getting lunch and they were filming this movie on on the uh, studio so I remember this movie very well and it was really exciting when you were young um, you know especially as a young boy in that era uh, post World War II, you know, it was it was about violence and warfare, so we loved it. That's what we were brought up on. So so the so the uh, the the background of of this lecture is based on this film. So I'm using this film as an example. I'm going to show you, or you're going to watch uh, the kind of trailer, the preview for it. You get an idea. So what I want you to look at is how they present this as the great white people coming across the land and subduing it. Uh, it wasn't quite that way, but that's the way we, we like to present it, especially white America. So please watch the film entitled How the West Was Won trailer. It's less than three minutes. It's just a preview of the movie. Go ahead and watch that. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about and come on back. OK, so you, so you see this this excitement, this adventure. Yeah, you know, this this uh, it's it's all about men and adventure and, and taming the land and taming the savage Indians. I mean, were they savage? Were I mean, they were just people living like anybody else? Okay. Um, so we go back to the angel um, westward expansion ordained by God. We or, ordained by God. We talked about the angel and and what this image means. Uh, <clears throat> this concept was the backbone of American expansion westward in the 19th century. And, and understand me, it cannot be denied that a, the birth of a powerful nation has been the result. And, you know, a, a nation with great wealth and, and great charity. And we should be proud of that as Americans. You know, so again, I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just trying to tell the story of how it happened, how the land changed, how the people were, were, were treated. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So it was pretty clear, even at the end of the 19th century, that America would be for white people, as the government, society, and culture continued to be motivated by white supremacy. The end of the Civil War, Reconstruction, the, the northern the northern people didn't stop the southern people from taking the South back over. The government didn't stop them uh, because white supremacy reigned. Okay. Uh, the government in the country was to be an advantage for white people. And of course, the westward expansion movement is makes that pretty clear. <clears throat> Going back to Frederick Jackson Turner, American development has exhibited not merely advance along a single line, but a return to primitive conditions on a continually advancing frontier line <clears throat> in a new development for that area. In this advance, the frontier is the outer edge of the wave, the meeting point between savagery and civilization. So there's an historian calling it savagery on the one side and civilization on the other. So I mentioned before about the ambiguity of the word civilization. What does that mean? What is civil? Civilized means something different to different people. But here's an historian, a, a man that's supposed to be, you know, have a neutral point of view and not push his agenda, he calls the native savage and the white civilized, okay? <clears throat> uh, so this, this frontier thesis that he wrote became a very popular idea. 
And again, this is a repeat. The frontier is the outer edge of the wave, the meeting point between savagery and civilization. Uh, so the, the uh, Turner's frontier thesis talk, spoke boldly of, of the apparent right <clears throat> of Europeans to march across the land, in his mind, ultimately for the better, um, the, the betterment of it. Okay. Um, and he had a, he had his his own idea about the chronology of of the of the West, and, and this is it. <clears throat> it begins with the Indian and the hunter. It goes on to tell of, of the disintegration of savagery <clears throat> by the entrance of the trader, the pathfinder of civilization. We read the annals of the pastoral age and ranch life, the exploitation of the soil by the raising of unrotated crops of corn and wheat in sparsely settled farming communities, <clears throat> the intensive culture of the denser farm settlement, and finally the manufacturing organization with city and factory systems. So it, it doesn't it doesn't take that many years to go from this. You start with the Indian and the hunter. Okay, and it's 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 not developed, but then the the disintegration of savagery, the diminishment of natives, comes by the entrance of the white trader, the pathfinder of civilization. And then you go through these stages: the pastoral stage, the exploitation of the soil, the raising of unrotated crops, sparsely settled farming communities first, then intensive culture, denser farms, and finally the manufacturing organization of the city and factory system. So this is his theory. Uh, and like the government sur survey maps with the Homestead Acts, uh, he reflects that these lands that have been conquered are, are virgin lands wide open and empty, ready for settlement. Again, we've already learned that that's not true. Millions of indigenous people live there. But they would soon be pushed out and not in, in a nice way by God's chosen people. Like everyone else, uh, Turner failed to mention the effect this movement had on Native Americans who were indigenous to the land and have been living on the land for thousands of years. Uh, Turner also spoke of the frontier and westward expansion as components of the development of an American character. So I've already talked about this a little bit. Just go a little bit deeper here. And this concept called the rugged individualist is born. And this is what the rugged Western man's like. Uh, and this, this all developed because of this constantly moving frontier line. This, the challenges of that frontier line and, and keeping it going west and pushing the natives back was responsible for the creation of an American character. And that's the idea of where the rugged individualist was, was born. Not take no for an answer, no task too big. These Western people developed a bravado. And this was extended each time the frontier line moved and a new European settlement was begun. You know, they wanted their way and did not let anything stop them. That's the new American character, the arrogant American character. This would this would later be coined the ugly American. So going to, going forward, you know, another 60, 70, 80 years from what we're talking about. But just to give you some context, William J. Letterer wrote a book in 1958 called the called the um, ugly American. Okay. And what this is talking about <clears throat> is the perceived arrogance of Americans, specifically men, when they travel abroad. They, they feel entitled, they, they feel privileged because I'm a white American. <clears throat> the ugly American was inspired by Turner's thesis. Uh, and even today, uh, you know, when you look, when you travel abroad, modern Americans are still considered to be bold and arrogant and believe that their way is the only way. <clears throat> So of course, this is very ethnocentric. My way is the best way, get out of my way, I do what I say, or you'll pay. Uh, <clears throat> so of course, I bring this up because isn't this still happening today? I and mean, people don't like Americans when they're abroad. Why? It starts back in this era. Another reason why it's important to go further back in history than your own life. You learn about where ideas come from. Westward expansion created a whole different type of American that became bold and arrogant and not everybody likes that and continues on today. Uh, this uniquely American character 
which is perhaps perhaps all right best personified in in modern times not 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 the near modern times but in my lifetime by the masculinity of the popular actor of the 20th century john wayne and if you've ever seen the john wayne movies they're very pro-america and there's certainly something wrong with that don't get me wrong but this is a man that, that always comes out on top, always gets the girl, always defeats the bad guy, always defeats the natives, has the fastest horse, can shoot the, he, he's just the best, okay? And there's dozens of John Wayne, John Wayne movies to watch. They're on, uh, they're on uh, cable TV all the time. Uh, so this defiance and single-mindedness was also apparent in the way these white people dealt with the indigenous people of the lands that they now claimed as their own by pushing these peoples out and excluding them, and in fact, ultimately removing them from their ancestral lands to reservations. So, so again, a movement supposedly ordained by God took on characteristics that were hardly divine. Uh, according to the American historian Gordon S. Woods, a very popular historian that writes uh, many books, very many uh, best-selling uh, books, but scholarship. This is a this is a, a a true scholar, academic. The European invasion led to Indians being lied to and cheated of their land and their furs by greedy white traders and land-hungry migrants. So the New Republic continually violated Native treaty rights and killed or displaced tens of thousands of Indians. So there, there's there's a very prominent man today that's saying it like it is. So it's not, this is not my point of view. Again, I'm, I'm building off of historians' work and I'm presenting it to you. This is modern history and how we see it now. This is how we see the westward expansion. It was more of an invasion. And, and the Indians were, were obliterated obliterated with genocide and, and cheated and lied to and broken promises and broken treaties and killed and displaced, okay? Um, okay, uh, what I want you to do is watch one more film, then we'll end this. Uh, please watch the film entitled How the West Was Won Grand Finale. This is another part of the film. So understand what this film is. It, this is an epic film that, 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 that spans, uh, gosh, it probably uh, 40, 50 years, and it tells the story of westward expansion. Um, so it starts, um, you know, um, well, okay, the, the film you're going to watch is, is the end of the film. It's the last scene of the film. So this entire epic adventure film has already happened. And what you'll see is a, is a, is a, carriage going through the desert and they seem to be going home and it's it's a man and his wife and their children and an old woman and she's singing a song okay uh the old woman at the start of the movie was a young woman and she and her family come west across the erie canal and they go through all these you know mishaps and adventures and they have this you know their, their lives and then they have kids and 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 their sisters have kids, and this movie's all about kind of this extended family. So this is the end of the movie where all the adventures behind them, and now they can go home and settle down, and it's all good. The West has been won, okay? So so stay with me a little bit here. It's, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a little boring for the first couple of minutes because they're just singing this 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 old song. But, you know, it's it's somewhat touching if you've seen the movie. But what I want you to really focus on is not that part. I want you to focus at the end of the film, the second half of the film, when the narrator comes in and starts to talk about, about how the West was won. And it goes from the desert and it goes to what they call progress. And you see, you know, um, you see uh, cities popping up and rivers and streams and canals and factories and strip mining. And, and it keeps going and going and going. And he's, talking all these patriotic words about the greatness of it, and it certainly was. But again, the, the, the point is to try to get you to understand how quickly the land changed. It's not a judgment. It goes all the way into modern times, which of course then was 1963, and it shows this freeway system that's huge. So the point I'm trying to make is, you know, even a, a, an historian of today might look at that and criticize that because you destroyed the land. But in 1963, this was seen as all good. So this is how, how history and scholarship changes, okay? Okay, so please watch that, that film and then come on back. 
okay, so um, kind of an interesting end where you see, you know, what it, what what they call progress. In the last couple of minutes, you go across this kind of spectrum of things that that is seen as as moving forward. Okay. Okay, to end the lecture, the relevance of the lecture, the truth of the Western expansion era is like much of recorded American history and these people's lives and experiences get lost in legend and the real history is obscured. Today, a typical American is still not ready to let go of the myths of their Western history and embrace the realities of the American story. Okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number three. And that is also the end of chapter 16. Thank you.